Welcome to today's webinar, Managing Broadleaf and Grassy Weeds in Warm Season Turf, brought to you by Landscape Management and by our sponsor, New Farm. I'm Allison Barwatz from North Coast Media, Digital Editor for Landscape Management Magazine, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. The recording will be available one day from today on our website, landscapemanagement.net slash webinars. A link to the on-demand recording will also be mailed to you when it is available. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please note that in the lower left-hand corner of your console, there is a submit button. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. Just type in the text box at the bottom left, then click Submit to place your question in the line. Questions that were submitted during registration may be covered in this webinar. Some questions may also be answered in an upcoming issue of Landscape Management Magazine or in one of our weekly e-newsletters, LM Direct. We strive to answer as many of your questions as possible. Finally, if you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, select Help to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Diane Safranek or I will personally assist you. Also, if you would like to join the conversation in on Twitter, the hashtag for this event is BYBWebinar. Also, CEUs are available for attending this webinar. You can receive one CEU toward Planet Landscape Industry Certified Recertification or one point toward Tennessee Pesticide Recertification. To receive credits from Tennessee, you must remain on the webinar for the full hour and follow the instructions in a slide at the end of the presentation. Now, I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, Landscape Management Editor, Marisa Palmieri. Thank you, Allison, and welcome everyone to the first in our 2015 series of Build Your Business webinars. We have two great speakers lined up to cover um, both the management and best practices um, sides of our topic today. So I'll introduce our speakers and thank our sponsor before we get started. Um, first, we have to thank New Farm, our sponsor, for making today's webinar possible. We have Rod Marquardt uh, on the line. He's national LCO and Key Accounts Manager for New Farm, and um, he's just going to give a, a quick welcome and thank you. So, Rod? Thank you, Marisa. Hello, this is Rod Marquardt with New Farm. Um, as the National LCO and Key Accounts Manager for New Farm, I am dedicated to uh, working with and providing solutions for the lawn and landscape industry. Uh, New Farm is the manufacturer of a large portfolio of herbicides, insecticides, and fungicides including warm season herbicides such as Manor, ProSedge, ChangeUp, and SureGuard. We at New Farm are very excited to be a part of this webinar. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Rod. <clears throat> and now let's say hello to our speakers. First up today we'll have Jim Brosnan, PhD, and Associate Professor of Turfgrass Weed Science at the University of Tennessee. His research focuses on effective and economical strategies for broadleaf and grassy weed control in various turf grass systems, including golf courses, athletic fields, and residential landscapes. Jim served as an advisor to the Tennessee Turf Grass Association Board of Directors, and he's actively involved in the Weed Science Society of America, the Southern Weed Science Society, and the Sports Turf Managers Association. And then following Jim's presentation, we'll hear from Harold Enger, Director of Education for Spring Green Lawn Care Corp., which is a national franchise system based in Plainfield, Illinois. Harold has worked in the green industry for more than 35 years with Spring Green since 1997. He conducts 16 regional professional development seminars for Spring Green 77 franchise owners and their employees in 26 states in addition to counseling new franchise owners on application procedures, diagnosis, calibration, and safety. 
He's been a panelist at the Green Industry Conference. He serves on the board of directors for the Illinois Professional Lawn Care Association, and he's also a board member for Project Evergreen. So we're really happy to have Jim and Harold here today. And um, with that, uh, we'll get started. So turning it over to you, Jim. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, some considerations for managing uh, turfgrass weeds uh, in 2015. In my uh, position at UT, I have the uh, ability and, and privilege to look at a lot of different uh, pieces of weed control technology and how they fit into uh, different weed management scenarios, and that really helps in providing advice for uh, the end user in tackling weed management problems. So it's always exciting to give these types of webinars to share uh, what we've learned through research that can be applied uh, in a field situation. And my presentation today will not focus exclusively on specific products for specific weeds. I'm going to point you towards uh, some online resources at the end of my time uh, that you can use to help an answer specific questions about uh, how do I control uh, a particular weed in St. Augustine grass, for example. Um, what I'd like to use the time today for is uh, kind of an overview of some bigger picture things to consider when building um, your weed management programs for this year. And obviously, uh, aesthetics is a is a very big uh, reason why uh, we manage turf. We need uh, the the aesthetic value of the industry, uh, not only the turf industry but the green industry uh, as a whole uh, is quite large. And having weed free turf uh, is a big part of that. And one of the challenges is. We have a lot of weeds, and weeds are quite persistent, whether it's uh, winter annual weeds, uh, such as henbit in the top of the photo, uh, or as we're seeing germinate here in Tennessee in the south right now, uh, smooth crabgrass, a summer annual weed. Uh, or uh, to the left of the slide, we see uh, a picture of a fall seeding where we had weeds come in during a fall seeding uh, of a lawn. Weeds continue to be problematic in almost every scenario. And as alluded to, uh, there's a negative financial implication to this that I, I don't really feel is talked about enough. Uh, the only piece of data we have uh, direct to the value of weed management in turf and ornamentals uh, was uh, published by Bridges in 1994, and they reported a $235 million uh, negative effect to the U.S. economy from weeds in turf and ornamental settings, uh, with that touching uh, in large part on the real estate market. Uh, you think about the curb appeal of a, a home with a weed-free lawn uh, and trying to sell that property as compared to a lawn that is uh, riddled with clover or crabgrass or ground ivy. There's certainly uh, something to be said for that. One of the things my uh, program here at Tennessee has focused on is um, weeds in athletic field scenarios and why it's important to uh, control weeds in uh, sports field situations, particularly in high schools or community parks and recreation type fields. Uh, we published a, a research paper in 2014 uh, where we looked at uh, what the effect was of having crabgrass or clover in a Bermuda grass sports field. And what we saw was um, very surprising in that uh, we saw the, the athletes or the end users of those fields had almost a 50% higher likelihood of suffering a concussion because of the presence of the weeds on those surfaces. And uh, that really serves as a justification um, for controlling weeds in athletic field scenarios. And there's also a, a many, many uh, environmental benefits to weed-free turf from a carbon sequestration standpoint and environmental filtering standpoint, things that go far beyond the scope uh, of today's presentation and the time that we have to discuss uh, weed management issues today. Uh, but having weed-free turf is, is certainly a benefit there. 
So with all that being said, uh, I think the first consideration, especially for the warm season um, market, is to consider uh, winter injury, and particularly winter injury to warm season grasses when making decisions uh, about summer annual weed management. Um, it is very common that summer annual weeds are controlled with pre-emergence herbicides. Uh, in certain climates, these materials have already been applied to the turf uh, in 2015. Uh, as we get north into the transition zone, um, those materials will be going out very, very soon. And uh, the reason winter injury matters is that the pre-emergence herbicides as a whole can affect turf grass rooting. Uh, here you'll see this is a Bermuda grass root that's been exposed um, to prodiamine in hydroponic culture, and we can see we have swelling of the root tip. Um, here's a close-up of what that would look like in a field situation with a Bermuda grass stolen and severe club rooting. And we see this on new establishment where if we put down one of the residual herbicides used for, uh, say, crabgrass control, if we try to establish new Bermuda grass in these areas, uh, we can have detrimental uh, effects on rooting. And what happened in 2014 was many people would apply their pre-emergence herbicide uh, before we had full spring green up of warm season grass, and they were caught with a winter kill situation. And then they had a soil active herbicide um, in, in the ground that can uh, compromise rooting. On the screen in front of you now is a list of uh, many of the pre-emergence herbicides uh, that we use in turf grass situations. Uh, you'll see a column of active ingredient names, trade names, uh, a column of mode of action, and then whether or not that, her uh, that herbicide can have effects on rooting. And I encourage you to use this uh, as a reference moving forward in your decision making. And as I mentioned, this was the story of spring 2014, in large part uh, because of the fact that uh, in the transition zone and areas where warm season grasses go dormant, applications of Roundup and Barricade go out for winter annual control post and pre-emergent summer annual control. And when these applications were made to areas where we had winter kill, uh, re-establishing new Bermuda grass was uh, very challenging. So encouraging folks to test for winter injury uh, mid-season. We've got a fact sheet available through the uh, Tennessee Turfgrass Weeds Extension website, which I'll share at the end of the talk, that will walk you through a very simple process of how to do that. The next consideration uh, is specific to um, sedges, uh, I would say in my time at Tennessee, we have seen uh, more questions about sedge control uh, over the past uh, probably three or four years. Uh, sedges and Kalinga species as well. Uh, the weed that you see pictured here is a green Kalinga, uh, similar to sedge, uh, to sedge species in the environments in which they uh, prefer to habitate in. If we compare Kalingas to sedges, um, Kalingas are perennials that form mats uh, and spread through rhizomes. One of the reasons that Kalingas uh, are very problematic in turf is they can produce up to 100 flowers and 5,000 seeds with high viability. Sedges are very similar. Uh, one sedge plant can produce thousands of tubers that can live in soil uh, for multiple years. And if you want to tell the difference between green Kalinga or false green Kalinga, uh, it really is a, uh, something that's separated out by flowering timing. Uh, but luckily, herbicides that target sedge species are also very active uh, on Kalinga species as well. So I would say that my consideration number two is that if you're going to pick a pre-emergence product, I'd, I'd encourage you to pick one that acts on both annual grasses and sedges. Uh, an example would be Echelon 4SC. Uh, the active ingredients in this herbicide are perdiamine plus sulfentrazone. It's labeled for use in Bermuda grass, zoysia grass, centipede grass, St. Augustine, seashore pass palum, uh, an array of cool season turf grasses as well. 
and you can see the rate range is listed uh, on the screen. There's a potential. I know that FMC, uh, the company that manufactures this product, is pursuing labeling for ornamentals, hopefully in 2015. Another option would be freehand, uh, 1.75G. Uh, this is commonly used in ornamental production and also has labeling for use in warm season turf, uh, particularly Bermuda, Zoysia, Centipede, St. Augustine, and Seashore Pass Palum. It's a granular product that goes out at 100 to 200 pounds uh, of product per acre, and it has uh, rob a robust ornamental label uh, as well. Both of these herbicides are going to be very active on summer annual grassy weeds as well as sedge and Kalinga species uh, in turf. And with any conversation on prees, it's important to talk about putting these out at the correct timing and using Forsythia bloom to gauge that application. Uh, border Forsythias will bloom at the same soil temperature conditions where we see uh, crabgrass seed germination uh, begin. Uh, so you can really use this as almost a traffic light for when to start your pre-emergence program. Uh, I would encourage you to, to make sure that you're looking at a border forsythia plant. There are other uh, plants that will bloom earlier than border forsythia, particularly winter jasmine, uh, that can fool you. Uh, but forsythia is, is really the tried and true indicator. There was a robust study done uh, in Ohio State in the late 2000s where they looked at over 100 different ornamental plants as phenological indicators of crabgrass seed germination and border forsythia was the one that was most uh, closely related. Uh, another best practice uh, with any pre-emergence product is to make sure that you water that herbicide uh, into the soil. The label will tell you uh, a quarter to a half an inch uh, of irrigation or rainfall within 24 to 48 hours. If you're managing turf with an irrigation system, obviously that's a mechanism uh, to apply that uh, water treatment, uh, or you can try to time the application uh, around a period of rainfall. And it's integral that you do this. We need to move that herbicide into the soil to act on the weed seeds on which we're trying to control. If we leave the herbicide uh, on the foliage, it's not acting on the uh, target. And it's also subject to uh, volatility loss by uh, being exposed to sunlight in the atmosphere. I'd say my third consideration for this year is to, is to really manage your turf to reduce voids. Uh, in my part of the world, the most common lawn grass is tall fescue, which is a cool season uh, species. And a lot of effort is put into uh, renovation of tall fescue uh, lawns each fall. If you go to any hardware store, you can see an array of different seed mixes, and, and we really encourage fall establishment uh, and renovation uh, in, in our area. But what we see a lot is the efforts put into those renovations and then not uh, really cared for afterwards, and we see diseases like brown patch, which, which is what is pictured here, uh, come into a tall fescue stand and reduce the density of the turf. And there are strategies out there for brown patch control that uh, are really centered around reducing uh, summer applications of nitrogen and using particular uh, strobilian fungicide chemistries for management. But another thing you can do for all turf grasses, uh, and I know the focus here today is warm season turf, is to increase your mowing height. Um, some research out of Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma State in the late 90s showed that as little as a 164th increase in mowing height can increase uh, photosynthesis by 13% uh, simply by increasing the leaf area of the turf grass plant. And if you think about it, that's not very much. A 164th increase giving you 13% more photosynthesis, you're really making a stronger plant uh, that's going to be more competitive against weed infestation. And we've seen this in research. Um, the data you have on the screen in front of you uh, is a study that we did uh, here at Tennessee for two seasons and then concurrently at NC State and the University of Georgia for a season. We looked at an array of different pre-emergence herbicide products for crabgrass control, and we maintained them at two different heights of cut. So the Bermuda grass was maintained at either 0.6 inches 
or at 2 inches. Uh, on the graph, the 0.6 inch turf is the yellow bar and the 2 inch turf is the green bar. And what you'll notice is that regardless of product selected, we had better crabgrass control at the end of the season when we maintain the turf at a higher height of cut. This is a very simple uh, practice that can be done to really improve the efficacy uh, of any pre-emergence program uh, and lend what you're doing more to an integrated approach. And the reason for this, or one of the reasons I should say for this, is very simple that when we have a higher height of cut turf, we are shading uh, the soil surface and much like we need sunlight for grass seed to grow, weed seed, particularly crabgrass seed, also needs light to grow. So if we have a denser turf and we can shade the soil surface, uh, we're making it a less conducive environment for uh, crabgrass germination. The fourth consideration uh, is if you're dealing with perennial weeds, I encourage you to target perennial weeds in the fall of the year. Um, most of these, Dallas grass is what you see pictured here on the screen. Uh, most of perennial weeds will have a very robust uh, underground network of rhizomes uh, that they persist from over winter. Uh, here you have a Bermuda grass rhizome network with very thick rhizomes where carbohydrates can be stored uh, in fall uh, to allow for overwintering. And these facilitate the aggressive growth uh, of Bermuda grass in, in what seems almost uh, unattainable situations. This cone was behind my office building a couple of years ago when they were renovating the parking lot and the Bermuda grass uh, was able to grow around that traffic cone and then up and through that traffic cone uh, due to its aggressive nature. So when we're thinking about perennial weed management, I think it's important to ask questions about what's the desired stand, why is that the desired stand, how much of the perennial is in the desired stand, and really is selective removal worthwhile? Because often we may have enough of a perennial weed where selectively trying to remove it uh, might not be the most advisable measure. And you think about uh, a lawn like this. This is a lawn that's infested with Bermuda grass. Uh, they've tried to spray out the Bermuda grass here. And their percentage of Bermuda grass in that turf uh, really would almost render itself better to a complete renovation rather than trying to selectively remove uh, a number of different spots. And so timing is really the key with perennials. Uh, we've done a lot of research. I had a, a former PhD student here uh, named Matt Elmore. He did a lot of work with perennial weed management and identified uh, that fall timings were the optimal time for herbicide performance. Uh, and we really saw that when the average temperature for the day fell below 72 Fahrenheit, that is when we um, had the best efficacy in perennial uh, weed control programs. So use that 72 Fahrenheit in fall as kind of your uh, trigger when you take the average temperature, so the high plus the low divided by 2. When we fall below that temperature on a continual basis, we tend to get better results on perennial weeds. And this really aligns itself with the beginning of football season, post-Labor Day, the things that we think of uh, with the fall of the year. And also, uh, it's important on perennial weeds to recognize that if you choose selective removal, sequential applications over several years are likely going to be required for uh, eradication. With Bermuda grass, uh, this is really centered around programs of Fusil A2. There's a new product from BASF called Pilex. Uh, that also has activity for Bermuda grass removal. Uh, both of these uh, really are, go out with Turflon ester uh, in mixtures, be safe for use in tall fescue. Uh, Fusilade plus Turflon is also safe for use in soja. And Dallas grass control kind of falls under the same situation as Bermuda grass uh, in terms of that perennial approach. Uh, MSMA in long care scenarios is not uh, a foreseeable option. Uh, right now, we are limited to golf and sod use only. Uh, lawn and sports turf use is prohibited. Uh, for now, it's expected that we'll have a new ruling uh, probably sometime in 2017. Uh, but in golf and sod scenarios, we can continue to use MSMA uh, under the amended spot treatment directions of 2009. 
I list here uh, all of the herbicides that have Dallas grass activity uh, for you to have this slide as a reference and the turf species in which they are labeled. Uh, from what we have done here uh, in our research program, I would say that the, the best one of that group is probably tribute total. Uh, but again, uh, that is going to be a sequential application program over uh, multiple years, upwards of, uh, I would say, four to six applications for complete removal. The final consideration I'd like you to be aware of, and this is probably the most important one, is to acknowledge the threat of herbicide resistance and that herbicide resistance is a real thing. Uh, we could do a whole webinar on this topic. My research program here at Tennessee uh, focuses uh, it, almost exclusively on herbicide resistance these days because of the magnitude uh, of the problem. And this arises when we treat weeds with the same approach every year, whether that's the same product or the same uh, non-chemical non approach. Most common, it's picking a herbicide for a particular weed and then spraying that herbicide year after year after year without rotating to any other uh, different tactic. And we see the rate of uh, resistance rising greatly. Uh, I give a seminar at the National Golf Course Education Conference every year, and I uh, survey the audience there. And this year, 60% of the golf courses that attended that meeting said that they had seen some level of herbicide resistance at their facility. Really quick here, uh, this is just a map of Tennessee. This is We have 95 counties in Tennessee. Uh, the county shaded orange, the ones where we have confirmed the presence of uh, resistant weeds, particularly annual bluegrass in warm season turf situations. Uh, and the number of cases is growing. We're actively working now to uh, confirm more of these as they come in. And it can be scary. You, know, you think about making an application of a herbicide for annual bluegrass control, and this is what you're left with. Um, that is not good from a number of different reasons. And I'll highlight it here uh, with glyphosate as the example. So these plants were selected from a golf course that was using glyphosate for uh, weed control during dormancy. They were making applications uh, at 32 ounces per acre and did so every year since 1990. And the annual bluegrass evolved resistance to that treatment. So we looked at these plants and exposed them to glyphosate from rates of zero fluid ounces per acre on the left upwards to 256 fluid ounces per acre on the right. And what you'll notice is that the plant on the far right at 256 fluid ounces uh, is not, it's not controlled, it's not dead, it's alive, and it's actually producing seed. You think about the dissemination then of seed across a property that has the genetic capability to tolerate glyphosate uh, to rates as high as 256 ounces per acre, that's a very scary proposition that can get out of hand uh, very quickly. It's not only glyphosate, though. We've seen the same thing here with 4M sulfuron, the active ingredient in Revolver. Uh, we've seen it with trifloxy sulfuron, the active ingredient in Monument. We've got a susceptible population in green and a resistant population in red rates up to 139 ounces, that's eight times the label rate uh, in our resistant population is unfazed. Same is true with simazine. This is annual bluegrass exposed to simazine at eight pounds active per acre, that's eight times the label rate. The resistant plant is totally unaffected uh, and the susceptible plant is, as you would imagine, thoroughly controlled. The trends with resistance, as I mentioned, are the continued use of the same products without rotation lack of diversified weed management, uh, and an eye spray product X for weed Y mentality. And we need to avoid this uh, really at all costs because the economic implications are uh, enormous. Uh, this is one case study where a golf course before they had resistance was paying $50 per acre for weed control and now after resistance upwards of $143 per acre. Uh, resistance in annual bluegrass costing almost three times, the, uh, leading to almost a 3x increase in the cost of controlling weeds. That's all I have for technical content. Uh, I would point you to our website, TennesseeTurfGrassWeeds.org, for more uh, reference information on uh, different topics uh, pertaining to weed management and warm season turf. 
I'd also point you to mobileweedmanual.com. This is a mobile application that my group here developed at UT for selecting herbicides in turf and ornamentals. You can key in the weed that you're trying to control, uh, the turf or the ornamental species that you're trying to, trying to control it in, and it will give you all of the herbicides labeled for that situation. Uh, you can feel free to reach out to me through Twitter. Uh, I'm relatively active there, and we would be happy to field any weed management questions uh, through that platform. And if you're in the Knoxville area and would like to see our work firsthand, we invite anybody to come to Field Day uh, on September 15th here in Knoxville. That's all I have, and I will turn it back over to Marisa. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. That was great content, and um Hopefully, um, if anybody has questions, you'll be you'll be on here at the end for some Q and A, and we have some questions from beforehand too that we can um, ask and answer at the at the end during Q and A with both Jim and Harold. So um, type in your questions if you have more, and then in the meantime, we will um, we will turn it over to Harold for his portion of the of the presentation. Harold, go ahead. Are you still on mute, Harold? Yes, I was. <laughs> Sorry, and I even wrote myself a note. All right, well, we'll talk about this, uh, talk about controlling broadleaf and grassy weeds and warm, warm season turf. And you probably all know that the definition of a weed is a plant that is growing out of place, but it's also the number one complaint call that you get from customers without a doubt. So when you go out to deal with weeds, what you have to first determine is what type of a weed is it. Is it a broadleaf weed? Or is it a grassy weed? You need to be able to identify those, and that's where those apps like what Jim was just talking about are very helpful to you. There are other things, though. There are grass-like weeds, such as your sedges or your rushes or the kalingas that you can get uh, in a lawn. So you need to be able to identify that. And then there's another section or type of weed, we just kind of throw those in and calling them other weeds like wild onion, wild garlic, star of Bethlehem. These are ones that you can have, you deal with uh, on a regular basis depending on where you are in the country. One of my favorite stories is the word uh, Chicago, which is where I'm from, um, actually is an Indian word that means stinking onion. So Chicago actually means land of stinking onion. Uh, you also need to know the growth pattern. How is this weed growing? Is it a, um, does it have a rosette, like a dandelion, so that you're helped to, to help identify that? What's its growth pattern? Rosettes, like uh, uh, dandelions. Is it growing upright? Is it um, a lateral or prostrate weed? So uh, that are growing out, they have a central taproot and they radiate out from that central taproot and get bigger and bigger. So you have to sometimes pick that weed up and see if it's just one lateral weed. Or you can have what are called stoloniferous or vining type weeds that grow, like clover is stoloniferous. So that creeps out, and as the, where the node hits the ground, it sends out roots, and from there it can spread and spread and spread and get larger and larger. So again, work towards identifying this plant. Then you also need to know the life cycle. Now, that's something you probably can't tell when you first are looking for this weed, but when you are researching this weed, is it an annual? Meaning, does it come up in the spring or summer and then die in the fall? Or is it an annual that germinates in the fall, such as uh, shepherd's purse that we see here? Very common. It will actually germinate in the fall, overwinter in that vegetative state, and then in the spring, it bolts, shoots up the flower head, and uh, reseeds itself in the spring, dropping more, lots of seeds at that time, and then they sit there until the following fall. We also have biennials, and biennials live for two years. The first year they grow usually in a rosette shape uh, and grow... Um, and then the next, and grow vegetatively, they stay, stay that way. And then the second year, they will bolt and they will send up the flower head. You can also have perennials, such as our, one of our favorites, the Virginia buttonweed, uh, growing, um, continually growing throughout the year. 
So that can be another problem when you are trying to choose the right material to control these weeds. The other thing to think about is why is this weed in the lawn? Why am I having this problem? And Jim alluded to some of these things. Uh, but you can have poor cultural practices, mowing practices. Are they mowing it too short? I've always said one of the best weed control methods of them all is to mow your lawn high. Keep the weed seeds from heating up and germinating. And you can see that continually. And I really like the fact that uh, Jim mentioned that 13% higher, 13% uh, increase in photosynthesis by 1 64th of an inch. Boy, I'm going to use that one when I'm talking to people in the future because it will really help in explaining to them the reasons why they need to mow higher. You know, there's four main reasons uh, by mowing high. The first, of course, is photosynthesis. Second of all, shading the ground underneath to keep it cooler, moist. You don't have to water it as much. The third, probably the more important one, is that you're going to keep the weed seeds from heating up and germinating. And, of course, the balance of nature by the roots corresponding uh, to depth of the height of the plant. But overall, you're going to get a healthier turf with less weeds if they mow high. So that's one of the things you need to work with your customers on a regular basis and give them the reasons why, because that will really help them and convince them to mow uh, their grass higher, depending upon the species, what the right height is. The other thing is weaker thin turf. In the winter damage in 2014, we saw a lots of weeds because the lawns thinned out because of that. But it could be because of insect damage, uh, chinch bugs, or you could have um, last year, last fall, in parts of the southeast, uh, armyworms were just everywhere, eating up lawns really fast. So now you've got no turf cover, you don't have any grass there, sun gets down, heats up those weeds, you can get an increase in weed uh, growth at that point. You can also have insect and disease damage that thins out a turf, such as chinch bugs in this situation, uh, where it, the lawn is thinned out. Again, there's no competition for those weeds. Weeds are, um, will just grow when the, they are able to get the sun and some rain, usually. You can also get invasion from surrounding sources such as chamber bitter. Oftentimes this will first start maybe in a flower bed. People don't do anything with it, and then slowly those seeds will move out into the lawn, and then you'll become a bigger and bigger problem uh, out into the lawn. So make sure that you are looking for how does this weed growing when you're trying to identify it. You can also get winter damage. Um, now, this happens to come from the Chicago area, but I know that there's a lot of salt used down south, too, on, uh, when you have ice storms. You can have this type of thing. You think, well, nothing's going to grow where all that salt damage was. But there are weeds that will grow in there, like knotweed will grow into an area that has been thinned out by salt. It doesn't stop it from growing. Now, as far as for identifying, there's a lot of apps. One thing I caution you, if you go into Google Play or something like that and type in weeds, you really got to search because there's a lot of other types of weeds that there are uh, apps for. So just uh, you might have to scroll through several pages to find the right ones, or if you know the name of the app, such as um, TVI Gordon's has weedalert.com, you can go into their app. Um, Spectracide has an app for identifying weeds. Um, the uh, North Carolina State University has a lawn care app that gives you more information just than weeds, but um, it's also a useful app to have on your phone. Sometimes that's an easy thing. I also I like the fact if I can show a customer something from a university website, they're more likely to believe me because they don't sometimes trust you, but if you have an, uh, another source that um, – says the same thing, they'll be more likely to, uh, to agree with you or believe you. Books are great uh, for identifying weeds, and one of the best ones for lawns, I know uh, there was one of the questions that said, what kind of a lawn care program do I need for warm season grasses? Well, this book will give you a lot of information on the different types of grasses. Uh, what you should put down as far as the amount of nitrogen and what, what lawn care programs that you should use on yours. If you've never per purchased this book, I would highly recommend it. It will give you a lot of information about caring for uh, warm season turf. As far as identifying, this book, another one from Clemson Extension, 
uh, is another great tool to have in your truck with you to help you identify weeds. It's like 12 or $14 to purchase from them, and it's well worth it to buy it for every one of your uh, applicators that are working with you because it will help them also identify weeds. A lot of these guys have no experience in this, and so if at least they can go through and uh, look at the pictures and say, hey, that's that weed or that's that weed, it makes it a lot easier for them, and then they can work on uh, trying to determine how to control that weed. There's field guides that you can get. Um, Dow Turf and Ornamental Weed Guides, the new one that they just came out with, they, they redid it. Um, those are available if you contact your Dow rep, your local Dow rep. They'll, I'm sure they will send you one or two copies. Uh, I have seen them on the counters at John Deere Landscapes giving you information. And this is a great one. Now, the only thing with that is that it gives you both warm season and cool season weeds. So there might be some weeds in there that you don't have, but still a good thing. Landscape Management uh, has uh, weed, uh, their Weed Watch, which is uh, something else that you can use. Um, you can possibly print that off of their website. So the other thing you have to know is what type of turf grass is in your lawn. Because some of the products can be used on Centipede, it can be used on St. Augustine, you can't use it on Bermuda, or you can use it on Bermuda, you can't use it on this. You need to know what type of grass is in your lawn, and that's really important so that you're using the right products so you're not causing any lawn damage. Sometimes the difficulty comes in when you have multiple species of grasses in a lawn, so you have a lawn that has both Centipede and St. Augustine. Well, that can be a difficulty because there might be a product you want to use that you can use on St. Augustine, but you can't use on Centipede. So it's something that you have to talk with your customer about is what grass are they really wanting to have in this lawn? Is that the St. Augustine? And if there's some damage to the centipede, they're okay with it. The big thing about weed control or any of these things are communication and education with your customers. You need to spend time so that they know whether that weed is an easy-to-control weed or it's going to be taking, you know, as the way that Jim was talking about, six to ten applications to try to control Dallas grass in a lawn. It's not something that's going to happen right away. If you send out your literature and they say, oh, we'll give you a weed-free lawn, and they're covered with Dallas grass, well, you know that that's not going to take one or two applications. It's going to take a couple of years to get that grass under control. If you tell them up front, and educate them up front and set expectations, they'll be more understanding that, yes, you're working on this problem and you're trying to get it reduced. Choosing the correct product. Well, there's a whole bunch of products. I'm sure you all are, are wondering, which one can I use for this and this? Well, um, you need to go and look at the products, talk with, uh, look at the labels to find out what product is the best one for the grass type and the area that you're working in. Uh, there's, there's products that you can use in North Carolina that work real well on these weeds, but if you go down to Mississippi or Alabama, they don't work at all. So it's really something that you have to learn on your own. So how do you do that? Well, you can go to websites. Uh, North Carolina has a good one. Um, what I like about it is you can just type in the name of the weed. It will bring it up, and it will give you control options. They'll list you all the different chemicals that you can use on controlling that weed, and they give efficacy ratings. Like the, and from their standpoint, what works in their area. So I strongly recommend uh, turf files at uh, North Carolina State. Um, Clemson has another one, and they actually have a downloadable guideline for professional turf grass managers that you can just download from their website and gives you all this information that you can use when trying to decide what product you want to use. And they tell you whether it can be used on what grass type, and it's a, it's a good way to get started. You can also, there's a lot of universities that have this. Uh, Auburn has another one, um, you know, turf grass weed control recommendations. Uh, you know, you saw the information that uh, Jim gave on University of Tennessee, how uh, they have the same thing that you can get there. And then um, your manufacturers and distributors, talk to them. They will t help you in uh, determining what product is best for that particular weed. Understand that they're trying, they want to sell you their product, which is okay. That's what they, their job is to do. 
But it's a good idea to talk to the manufacturers of these different products. Talk to the rep and say, you know, I'm trying to control Dallas grass or I'm trying to control Virginia buttonweed. What do I, what would I want to use to do this? And if they're a good company, they'll also say, well, you know, these products won't work, but if you use FMC's product or if you use Syngenta's product, they'll, they'll help you out because they want you to succeed. Your distributors like John Deere Landscapes or Winfield or Southern States, when you talk to those guys uh, at the stores, you can also ask them what products are being used, what are other people buying to control this and that. Again, they're going to recommend the products that they sell, which is okay, but uh, you know, get that information from them so that you know what is working best in your area. Talk to your peers. Uh, I'm a um, founding member of the Illinois Professional Lawn Care Association. We get together as a group, competing lawn care companies, and we often talk about, hey, what are you using to control this or what do you use to control that? It's a great way of finding out what other people are doing and what kind of uh, results they're getting. Um, They're great people. (laughs) Your peers, your competing lawn care companies, they're great people. They will help you in uh, getting the right information. But the one thing I want to say is be wary of herbicide cocktails. Sometimes you get people telling you, well, I mix a little bit of this and I mix a little bit of that, and then I go out and spray. You know, unless you know for sure that those products, first of all, are compatible to each other, it might not be the best solution. So just be wary of those kind of homemade cocktails that people uh, put together sometimes. I can't stress enough that before you purchase any product that you read the label. Now, I know that the label has a lot of information, and some of these labels can be 40, 50, 60 pages long, and they become daunting to say, I can't read all that. I don't have time to read all that. Actually, most of the information you need is within the first four or five pages. And what is it the information you're looking for? Well, first of all, you want to know if the turf species that you're being treated is on the label, that you can use it on that type of grass. And is the weed that you're trying to control on that label? Now, there are thousands of weeds out there, so not necessarily all the weeds will be listed, but the most common ones. So they probably will be on that label. Sometimes you can go ahead and use that product, um, even if it's not on the label, if it's site labeled, meaning if it's labeled to use on residential properties, you can then go ahead and use it, um, but you just may not know whether it's going to control that particular weed. Determine the rate. What rate is, uh, for that weed is being controlled? Some uh, will state that you put down a half an ounce per thousand, and then for these weeds, you need to put an ounce per thousand. Take a look at that. Mixing instructions. Are there things like, does the product have to sit for X number of minutes before you use it because it's a water dispersible granule and it has to release within the water? Um, how long that product can be kept in a mixed form? Some of these products uh, will, after 24 hours, will be less effective. Um, whether you should use an adjuvant like a spreader sticker, an anionic uh, sticker, or something like that, it will tell you in the directions on what you should use. I always remember that when Drive first came out, and we were using it, and we weren't getting very good control, and I talked to the BASF rep about it, and he said, well, did you use MSO, methylated seed oil? And I said, what's that? I've never heard of it. And he said, well, it's in the label. I went, aha, read the label. So you had to use MSO with, at the time, with the drive to make sure that it worked effectively. Are there any special uh, personal protective equipment requirements? Uh, Do you need to wear long sleeve shirt, um, rubber gloves? One thing I wanted to mention about rubber gloves, if you use a ride-on applicator, like a Magnum or a, a Pathfinder or whatever, and you're spraying with that, you need to be wearing your rubber gloves when you are driving that piece of equipment. That's uh, what the states are saying that you should do. Then the other thing are looking at what are the temperatures and wind speed maximums that you uh, can apply this. That's very important. Some of these products you can only use up to 85 or 90 degrees. Uh, Maybe it's 10 miles an hour, maybe it's 15 miles an hour. You need to stay within those uh, ranges. Are there any compatibility concerns? Can this be mixed with other products, let's say like a, a liquid, we, uh, liquid fertilizer? Can it be used with that? What is the timing between applications? Can, how, soon, how long do you have to wait before you can make a second application? Is it 14 days? Is it 28 days? 
Uh, some, it will also tell you if there's types of spray equipment that can or cannot be used. And also the maximum or minimum amount of water or carrier that you have to mix with this product. Some do have minimums, like you have to put in at least a gallon per thousand square feet. So if you're using a write-on applicator, which is a lot less than that, 28 to 32 ounces, you may not be getting enough product out there when you're doing your applications. And then, of course, the reentry requirements. Is it until dry? Is it 24 hours? Whatever the label states. And then timing before and after application for seeding, sodding, or sprigging, depending on where you are. Um, you know, if you're going to be reseeding tall fescue and they, the customer just starts with you and it's uh, June and they would like to get their weeds under control first, remember that's about a six- to eight-week period that you have to wait from the last time of the application until when you can do your seeding. So keep that in mind and also how much time after the seeding before you can apply uh, a control product if you have weeds that come up after your seeding. In some cases it says two to four mowings or uh, four to six weeks, depending on what the situation is. Also, if you're doing a late seeding, like let's say in October, and you want to put down a pre-emergent in um, three months, two months later, well, take a look at the label because it will tell you how long you have to wait after the seeding before you can apply that product. And then finally, what are the cleanup and uh, disposal requirements for that product? Uh, are there anything special that has to be done with that? So spreader, um, a couple of things about your spreader sprayer calibrations that I wanted to mention. There is a great uh, reference manual. It's called Calibrating Write-On Pesticide Sprayers and Fertilizer Spray, uh, Spreaders. Aaron Patton at Purdue put this booklet together. You can go on their website. You can download this. What's great about it, it, it has a uh, worksheet in there that gives you step-by-step -step instructions on making sure that your write-on applicator is ca calibrated correctly. Sometimes effectiveness of that product is, effective, is uh, determined by your rate that you're applying. So if you're going too fast, you're not putting down the right amount of material, you're not going to get the control that you want. A lot of people don't think about calibrating their handheld or backpack sprayers, and that is another thing that you should look at. We have a tendency, it's a two-gallon hand can, we put two gallons of water in there, we put in enough for 2,000 square feet, and we say we're good to go. Well, is that necessarily enough, or is it too much? And if you go to this website, there is actually a um, little handbook on calibrating your backpack sprayers uh, so that you apply the, or your handheld um, equipment so you're applying the right amount. All of those things can add to the effectiveness of the product that you choose. So that's the information I wanted to get across to you about, um, you know, the best practices for controlling broadleaf weeds. Again, um, I, my uh, email address is at the beginning of the presentation. You could always send me an email if you have additional questions. Uh, I'm one of the Planet Trailblazers, so that if you have questions about information, about, you know, you're just starting up, feel free to contact me and I, I can help you answer your questions. And with that, um, oh, one thing else, spraying systems, um, gallons per thousand. Make sure you know how much you're spraying and you're checking your rate every day so um, that you know that you're putting down the right amount of material. Again, uh, if you're not getting it right in the down down the right amount of material, you're not going to be getting good control. And with that, I will say, um, you know, determining the cost is the last thing. Just because the product is um, cheaper, you, you buy a, a gallon container of this and it's $100, you buy a gallon of that and it's $80. Well, that one's cheaper, but not necessarily, because if this one, the use rate is an ounce and a half per thousand, and that one is one ounce, the $80 one is actually your better cost. So the other part of your decision-making is what's the cost per thousand square feet or acre, depending on how you do it. And I thank you for your time. Uh, I enjoyed uh, being part of this webinar today. Thank oh, you, Harold. There you go. Oh, all, all excellent information. We really appreciate it. And we do have um, some questions that have rolled in here live, and then we have some questions from the um, pre-registrants as well. So we will get to some of those, and I'll just um, direct them to either Harold or Jim based on the, the subject matter. So um, 
One that came in um, a little bit ago at the end of Jim's presentation, so we'll jump back to talking about weed resistance. Um, Jim, the question is, when it comes to avoiding creating a resistant weed population, should a new chemical be used every year, every two years, or how often should the chemical be switched? Is there a rule of thumb there? Uh, there's no hard and fast rule of thumb other than to say that that is diversification is, is the key. And as much as you can diversify and as often as you can diversify, the better. In lawn care scenarios, due to the the round nature of the business, if you will, uh, I think diversification is probably uh, rather limited there where we we get into a suite of products that's going to be, this is the product for round one, this is the product for round two, round three, round four, and so on. And diversifying that as soon as you can will certainly help in fighting resistance. Um, yeah, if interested in trying to build better programs, uh, there are some resources out there. I encourage folks to go to uh, our website, TennesseeTurfGrassWeeds.org. There's a, a page on herbicide resistance that will give you background info about what it is, what causes it, uh, the current status of resistance in turf. And then there's also a um, example herbicide selection tool for annual bluegrass. So you can put in what you last applied, and then it will populate out uh, alternatives that vary not only the applica application timing, but the mode of action as well. Uh, so you, if you use this, it would it would populate out alternatives that would diversify things to prevent resistance. Okay, great. Um, we'll go back to Harold for this one, although you you both could probably answer it, but. Um, we had a couple questions about liquid versus granular. So, Harold, do you see any difference in effectiveness of granular pre-emergence versus liquid applications of the same product? No, I don't. You know, the biggest difference is going to be cost. Um, sometimes it's cheaper to uh, do a liquid application. But as Jim mentioned, regardless of the product, it has to be washed off of the plant and into the ground or to be activated. So, really, that's your biggest difference. There's really... They both work as long as you're using this, the right rate and that you're applying it at the, at the correct rate. That's probably the more challenging thing for people to determine, but, uh, you know, they, they both work. We have people who use um, liquid. We have people who use granule, and they have uh, equal results. Yeah, I would, I would second that as well. I mean, we do side-by-side -side comparison research trials. You don't, you don't see uh, major differences when um, used at equivalent rates and applied correctly. Uh, the only points I'll make about that is in warm season areas, particularly south of Tennessee as you get into the deeper south, uh, when those applications are made, it's difficult to find pre-emergence products not on fertilizer. And often putting out fertilizer at the times that we want to be putting out pre-emergence herbicides on warm season grasses is not really recommended. Um, I think that that Mindset comes from a cool season environment up north when you would put out your spring pre and you're going to have cool season grass growth and nutrition at that time would be um, advisable. But in the warm season areas, we tend to have either dormant turf or d turf that has just started the green out, pro green out process. Um, so in those situations, a, spray, uh, a sprayable treatment might be a little better. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Jim, we'll stick with you for this one. Um, the question is, we treat both fescue and Bermuda, Bermuda lawns in California. Um, what's the best product for post crabgrass crab control now that we don't have MSMA? I would say I mean, you, have, you have a few choices. Um, across the board, though, Quinclorac is probably, or Quinclorac-containing products would be the um, the best option on both grasses. Uh, you can get some Bermuda grass injury on certain cultivars uh, with Quinclorac, but usually that injury is very transient and short-lived. Um, the activity on crabgrass with that product will be excellent uh, in most scenarios, and there's a lot of Quinclorac-containing products out there now that it is a post-patent material. Okay, great. Um... I'm sure you can both answer this as well, but we'll ask Harold. 
um, what's a good amount of time to let sprinklers run after application? So how long do you let the water in for? Well, you know, as Jim mentioned in his quarter to a half an inch, and that really depends on the sprinkler system, the heads, the, the flow rate, all those type of things. Generally, I would say that if they leave their sprinkler on with a um, pulsating sprinkler or, you know, in a large area, half an hour should be enough to get your quarter inch down. Um, but in some situations where you have little pop-up sprinklers, a half an hour could flood the area out. So it, a lot of that depends upon your sprinklers that you have. But in general, I would think that if you left it on for a half an hour, you would get your quarter inch generally. Okay, great. Um, we had a lot of questions pre, um, from pre-registrants about St. Augustine lawns in particular. Jim, do you want to, I mean, they're all kind of general, just, you know, best best way to manage grassy weeds in St. Augustine lawns. Um, do you have any input there? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak too much in specifics about St. Augustine grass management just because it's a grass that doesn't grow in Tennessee, so I don't have any real firsthand um recommendations I can offer. I would just encourage you, as Harold uh, mentioned in his presentation, to try to reach out to uh, the local university in your region, um, and they'll not only have reference materials and literature about um, options for products in St. Augustine grass and weeds that are common in St. Augustine grass, but they'll also have extension staff that are employed by the university to help answer these exact types of questions. Uh, so depending on where you're at, whether it's Florida or Louisiana or uh, wherever your St. Augustine grass is uh, is found, I'd encourage you to try to use your local uh, university extension people to help you with that. I would strongly agree. Okay, great. And then um, we're right at an hour, so I know there's one question that Harold would like to would like to answer, and that's um, how do I get a license was, was one of the pre-registration questions. <laughs> yeah, I saw important. that one question, so. and um, you know, you've got to go to your state and find out. Uh, you can just put in, let's say, Kentucky pesticide license. I'm just using a state, and it will give you links on how to go about getting that uh, license. Just make sure that you do get a license. It's very important. It depends on the state. There's 50 different ways to get a license. Uh, and so each state has got their own requirements, but just go to your state uh, Department of Ag is generally who does it, and uh, they will give you the information on how to get licensed. And Extension can help you with that as well. I, I yes. can only speak for Tennessee, but you can go to a local county extension office in Tennessee and take the certification exam there. Right, as long as you've got the experience and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. there are, in some states, there are experience requirements that you have to meet in order to get a license. So make sure you know what those are too. For Florida, for example, has a two-year experience requirement. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you both for your time today. It was very informative. We really appreciate um, you guys taking part. Thanks again to New Farm for sponsoring today. And uh, we will turn it over to Allison to wrap up. Okay, thank you, Marisa. Um, as I said earlier, you can receive a Tennessee pesticide recertification. In order to receive the one point toward the recertification, please email LM editor Marisa Palmieri at mpalmieri at northcoastmedia.net with your name, company name, and applicator number following the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar contains contact information for each of the speakers. When you receive the when you receive the webinar 24 hours from now, you can you'll have a copy of the contact information as well at the end. Thank you for attending Managing Broadleaf and Grassy Weeds in Warm Season Turf. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the landscapemanagement.net website and will be emailed to you one day from today. Please visit the Landscape Management website for information about future events like this one. Thank you for attending, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you.